Welcome to the Ad Nauseam Podcast, where classical gourmands everywhere can finally get their fill. Join us for a delectable discussion of Greco-Roman civilization stretching from the Minoans and Mycenaeans through the Renaissance and right down to the present. And now, ladies and gentlemen, here are your hosts, Dr. David Noe and Dr. Jeff Winkle. Welcome, listeners, to episode 121 of the Ad Nauseam Podcast. I'm down here in the bunker. My name is Dr. Jeff Winkle, and with me, as always, is my good friend and co-host, Dr. David Noe. How are you feeling? I'm feeling really good about this episode. Are you? Yes. Because I think, I think one of the reasons you're feeling good about this is because it's in your wheelhouse. I it think. is in my wheelhouse. I actually contributed to the composition of the script, <laughs> unlike the previous 25. <laughs> I'm also feeling good because uh, summertime is uh, threatening to arrive here in Michigan. Mm-hmm. We've got warm temperatures, the grass is growing, the birds are birding, uh, the insects are doing whatever insects do. Yeah. It's great. It is. It just feels alive out there. It does. It's verdant and verdure. Yeah. I like to say that the two best months in Michigan Mm -hmm. are June. Yes. And um, I don't know, the last two weeks of September, first two weeks of October. I'm with you there. There's no place in the world that's as nice. It's true. Because there's no humidity. The sky is brilliant blue. Yep. Everything is bursting with life. Right. It's fantastic. The rest of the year, however. Well, oh, we don't need to get into that. <laughs> we don't need to get into that. How are you doing, Jeff? I'm feeling good. I'm, I, I was going to say a, a number of things along the same lines. It's um, um yeah, my, my kids are getting kind of, I mean, they are so ready to be done oh, with yeah. school. They got me a, a week and a half yeah. left, two weeks. And they're just kind of bursting at the scenes. Right. And they want to get out there on the trampoline and mm-hmm. uh, play some baseball and basketball. And so it's... Right. I, I love that kind of that vibrancy in the air. Would you say summertime and the living is easy? It's not easy. Fish are jumping and the cotton is high? Is that is that the next line? Yeah. Oh, your okay. daddy's rich and your mom is good looking? Um... Neither of those things. <laughs> oh, for two? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> Hope they're not listening. <laughs> yeah, there's no chance of okay, that. Okay, right. all right. Hey, what are we talking about today, Dave? We're going to talk about classical rhetoric. Okay. We're going to talk about how to give a speech as though you were Cicero or Demosthenes. Oh, two of the big heavy hitters. Or Yeah, or one of the other greats. We can go down you know, the list of all-stars. Yep. By Socrates, Aeschines, Isaias, Lysias, and so on. Yeah. And uh, we're going to take a pretty broad look here. Talking about Aristotle, Cicero, Quintilian, those individuals who either practiced rhetoric uh, or practiced it and commented on how to do it. Okay. Now, are we going to be talking about uh, specific speeches these guys made, or are we kind of get down to kind of the science of of rhetoric? Yes, not so much the specific speeches. Okay. So we're going to try to stay out of uh, history. I'll do my best not to throw out too many dates. We're going to stay out of the content of the particular speeches. We'll have to quote a couple of them for illustrative purposes. Mm -hmm. But what we're really looking at is the science of how to give a speech, particularly what's called the five canons of rhetoric. Okay. All right. The five canons. Now, um, I, th- this I'm sure this is something that will come along later, but um, are you ultimately going to come around to the point that these, these, um, these rules uh, right. still hold true today? Well, uh, that's one of the questions that to me is wide open. Okay. And so what I'm really hoping, among other things, you know, your usual witty and um, quite insightful asking of questions. Yes. Is if you can provide, you think that's empty rhetoric? No, no, no. no. You think I'm flattering you? I see that look on your just, face. Just, just go on, please. No, but it's, it's true, Jeff. You're yeah. an excellent interviewer. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> maybe a little throwaway, but in addition to that, help me examine, you know, the, the contemporary pulse. Do these things still hold true? Yeah. So we're going to have to look at, you know, what kinds of speeches have we heard, political or otherwise? Yes. Whom do we think, who do we think are good public speakers and why? Yeah. If the art is dead, thanks to the teleprompter. Yeah, you know, yeah, These yeah, kinds yeah. of things. Right, right, right. Okay. Yep. All right. So um, do we have an op- quote, an opening we, quote? We don't have a shout out. We don't have a shout but out. But we do right. have an opening quote. Okay. All right. And for this one, we went way back into the archives. We did. Okay. Yes. So first, let's roll the clip. Okay. This opening quote is actually an audio clip. Roll the clip, and then we'll give you the background and talk about it. The category in which Cicero shows his greatest technical competence deals with rhetoric. In our world, rhetoric has fallen upon hard times. We seldom use the word except in a disparaging sense, and usually with the prefix near to denote turgid artificiality in vocabulary and syntax. But the word and the thing have their legitimate uses. Discourse is a human product and therefore susceptible to the refinements of art, and the rules of the art are capable of being set down. Like other arts which are practiced socially and continuously, the art of table manners, for example, 
We learn the art of discourse by imitation, but handbooks of etiquette have their place nevertheless. Orators may unconsciously follow the rules of the handbooks, as poets may lisp in numbers, but somewhere in the consciousness of the lisping poet are the examples of predecessors who labored over the art, and orators who would be offended if the word rhetoric were applied to their efforts have assimilated the end product of classical theory and practice. So Winston Churchill's periods are unmistakably Ciceronian, whether or not he conned Cicero's treatises, which they would not have been if Cicero's treatises had not served as Europe's textbooks in the art of discourse through the centuries. Cicero himself was doubtless magnificently endowed by nature, but he composed his speeches strictly according to theory, as the studious elaboration of the rhythms at the end of his periods demonstrates. He considered himself an artist in the spoken word, and from his earliest youth and throughout his life, occupied himself with the theory of his art and its history. Very interesting. Now, now who was that gentleman talking So that's Moses Hadass. Okay. And Moses Hadass, uh, this is from 1955. Audio is from 1955 on vinyl. I actually moved it over from vinyl uh, 20 years ago, and it's published by Folkways Records. Okay. Have you heard of Folkways no. Records before? What, kind, what other smash hits came from Folkways uh, Records? I think um, Beat It, uh, Michael Jackson's Beat It <laughs> was on right. Folkways Records, yeah, right. if I'm not mistaken. That sounds about right, yeah. Right. Uh, and the, the name of the record is called Introduction to the Latin Language, Commentary and Readings in Latin and English by Moses Hadass. So Hadass was born in 1900 mm-hmm. in Atlanta, Georgia, which I think explains his rich, deep, southern, lilting tones. Mm-hmm. He was an American teacher, a classical scholar, a translator of numerous works from Greek, Hebrew, Latin, and German. Here we're cribbing Wikipedia. Raised in Atlanta in a Yiddish-speaking Orthodox Jewish household. Hmm. His early studies included rabbinical training. He graduated from, from the Jewish Theological Seminary of America in 1926 and got a doctorate in classics in 1930. Fluent in, you want to take over here, Jeff? He was fluent in Yiddish, German, ancient Hebrew, ancient Greek, Latin, French, and Italian. And well-versed in many other languages as well. So not a very smart guy. No. His most productive years were spent at Columbia, where he was a colleague of Jacques Barzun and Lionel Trilling. There he bucked the prevailing classical methods of the day. Textual criticism and grammar presenting classics, even in translation, gasp, Uh as worthy of study as literary works in their own right. Well, this next bit is also really, it's really quite striking for someone um, who had a career. That pedigree? Yes. He embraced television. As a tool for education, becoming a telelecturer. This guy was, he was distance learning before exactly. there was distance In learning. In the 1950s. Wow. And he was a pundit on broadcast television. He also recorded classical works on phonograph and tape. That's what we're listening to. Yep. You want to continue, please? Yes. He uh, says his daughter, Rachel Hadass, is a poet, teacher, essayist, essayist, and translator. With his first wife, he had a son, David Hadass, uh, who died in 2004, a professor of English and religious studies at Washington University. So this guy looked, and Jane Strosand and and Jane I guess Strosand, be so. another child of his. Gotcha. Right. So can you read uh, these two uh, celebrated witticisms of Hadass? Yes. Uh, the first one is this book fills a much needed gap. <laughs> yeah, I don't quite get how that's a witticism. <laughs> I mean, he's, like, he's putting it underneath the table because it's unsteady. Oh, is that, so it's kind of a, a visual pun. As I well think as, it's okay. a visual one. It fills a much needed gap, right? Right. The second one is much funnier. <laughs> Thank you for sending me a copy of your book. I'll waste no time reading it. <laughs> <laughs> I think I would have really liked this guy. Yeah. So this is the guy, Moses Hadass. And, uh, this particular recording, very hard to find. Yeah. Uh, but someone gave it to me a long time ago, or maybe I bought it on, on eBay. On vinyl? You had the LP? You had yes, the... I don't think I have it on vinyl anymore. Oh. I should have kept it. But I have all of the audio as MP3. Uh, so it's got Apuleius is the first one, right? Oh, wow, yeah. Plautus, Cicero, Catullus, Virgil, Horus, Ovid, Seneca, Tastus, Isaiah, St. Augustine, Robert II of France, Aquinas, Bernard, the Stabat Mater, Carmina Burana, Martin Luther, and Augustus Toplady. Hmm. So this is my kind of guy, Definitely, right? Yeah. Not, not only is he, um, you know, the real deal in terms of his philology, yes. but he's got a broad ranging interest. Right. Now, two things jumped out at me as yes. I was listening to that clip. The yes, fr- we got to get to the clip. Yep. So the first one was, is that he starts out by saying how rhetoric is kind of denigrated in his day. Yes. Which surprised me. Called mere rhetoric. Right. And so I was, because I always have this. Uh, kind of assumption that you know when people talk about you know the, the death of oratory or the death of poetry that these are 
comparatively more recent things. Right. And I was thinking of someone like a classical scholar, you know, who had kind of had his heyday back in the 40s and the 50s. Well, that would be kind of the sweet spot. Yeah. And, and it reminds me, um, I one of my historical hobby horses is the JFK assassination. Yes. So I've been reading a lot about John Kennedy lately. Yes, the checkers speech, the Nixon thing. Is the, that where you're headed? No, I'm, I'm actually talking, you know, the ass not what you can, what your country can do for you, right? <laughs> and so the Sounds I mean, like Diamond Joe Quimby I'm a little so bit. Sorry. And it's uh, generically supposed to be kind of like, like that, fr- fr- from the Northeast, yeah. right? Um, but that speech is, is held up, you know, in 1960. This would be right. five years after Hadass made this recording. That's right. As kind of a great piece of presidential oratory. Yeah. And so, well, I mean, yes, but granted, I think Gorgionic, it's filled with Gorgionic tropes. Right. But Can I say that? You you may say that. Okay. Right. But um, that's not the kind of the point I'm trying to make. Okay. I'm, I'm trying to make, I think that we have the sense that that was an era where a president could make a speech and it was still very, very important. Yes. Right. And oratory and being able to communicate through speech making was... Um, was central. I think that's less true, much less true today. I think that's true, but you're surprised because uh, Haddis is saying it was true in his time. Yes, exactly. Right. Right. And the second thing that jumped out at me, too, is it kind of reminded me of our recent Tarzan episodes where he was saying that Churchill's speeches um, were very Ciceronian. Right. And he says it didn't really matter whether yes. he patterned them on Cicero or not. It was in the water. It was in the education. Well, and that he could never have made a speech like that had Cicero not served yes. as the textbook for Western rhetoric right. for n- nearly 2,000 years. Exactly. So it kind of reminds me of Burroughs kind of writing that, that, that story of, in some in some ways, deliberately patterning on myth, but also that structure had been in place for thousands of years. Correct. Right. Correct. Okay. Yeah. The other point in this that is really our jumping off point for the episode yeah. is that I think he says words to this effect, and we'll see later this is, uh, uh, he's echoing Plutarch. I think um, Hadass says words to this effect, no doubt, uh, Cicero, Cicero was, uh, you know, gloriously endowed by nature mm-hmm. in his words to that effect Yeah. in terms of his natural ability and capacity, but his speeches were written just right according to the formulae, right? Yeah. They're written right according to the book. And that's really what we're looking at today. What is that formula for writing a great classical speech? Yes. That's yeah. the jumping off point. All right. So where do we go from here? Well, Jeff, I want to start with Aristotle. Okay. And here's the reason. You can tell me if you think it's valid. All right. Uh, my first academic job was uh, begun in the year 2000, and it was at a small school in uh, Northern Virginia. Mm-hmm. And uh, among the many things I was asked to teach there, one of them was uh, classical rhetoric and logic. And so this was very, really helpful for me because I had a lot of ideas floating around in my head that had never really been pinned down. Okay. So this allowed me the opportunity to straighten out those ideas. And I began with Aristotle. Yes. And the art of rhetoric. All right. Uh, now, there was an administrator at this institution, and some of those who are listening know who this person is. Uh-oh. So it's a bit of an inside joke. <laughs> uh, but when I chose uh, a rather high level administrator, when I chose Aristotle's rhetoric for the class, the comment was Aristotle, what does he have to do with rhetoric? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, just bear with me. I think I can prove this out. I think I can prove this out. Okay. So I signed this book, Aristotle's The Art of Rhetoric. It's the Penguin Classics. And uh, let's see, who's the translator uh, of this particular one? I think uh, it's not one of our Hackett texts, unfortunately, because um, I don't have that with me. But this is H.C. Lawson Tancred. Okay. And the, the uh, translation is from 1991. He starts with this. Rhetoric is the counterpart of dialectic. So those are the two twin terms, rhetoric, dialectic, for both treat of such things as are in a way common for all to grasp, and they belong to no delimited science. Accordingly, indeed, all men engage in them both after a fashion. That is, all men engage in both dialectic and rhetoric. For all men attempt in some measure both to conduct investigations and to furnish explanations, both to defend and to prosecute. Amongst the general public, then, some perform these tasks haphazardly, others by custom and out of habit. And since they admit of being carried out in both ways, it is apparent that it would also be possible to do them by a method. All right. Okay. Can you uh, break that down for us a little bit? Yeah. So Aristotle is saying at the beginning of the art of rhetoric, there are two different kinds of studies, um, rhetoric and dialectic, and they are the counterparts one to another. Dialectic is the formation of arguments and syllogisms, you know, how things work together if A, then B, and so forth. And rhetoric is the explanation of the logic that that lies within your mind or within your system. And his claim is twofold. Everyone does this. People in public tend to do it haphazardly, but everybody does it. And because it's a universal kind of experience, 
and this is just like what Haddis said, it's subject to um, a kind of scientific investigation, a methodology and explanation. Okay. So here's a very simple example. Uh, today before the podcast, I needed to get something framed, right? Now, it wasn't a colleague for committing a crime. It was a work of art. And so what I did is I went to the framing store, mm -hmm. right? And I had to interact with the clerk. And there was a little bit of rhetoric that was there, right? I said, I'm cheap, so I want a cheap frame. And she said, oh, okay. And she rolled her eyes and she went to the cheap section of the, of the store. But there was a, a kind of a rhetorical interplay, right? Yes. And here's where you can share an example of rhetoric in the real world. Um, I, like when I went to the framing store. Did you go to the framing I store? No, I try to stay away from places <laughs> like that, right? Um, I mean, so I, I, I guess to put this back on you. Okay. Right. I, I, I guess I don't really see. So where exactly was the rhetoric in the framing store? Like, you, where was the where was the argument? Well, where was she? The... She could have tried to persuade me to buy a more expensive frame. Yes. And I could have resisted with counter arguments. Yes. She could have used um, what we will find out uh, later on are um, emotional appeals, right? Appeals to pathos. She yeah. could have said something like. Uh, well, Mr. Noe, um, that's a lovely photo. Are you sure you want a lovely painting? Are you sure you want to put it in such a cheap frame? Mm. Right. She could have had that kind of emotional appeal. And I would have had to come up with some refutation or be stuck with a higher price. Yes. Right. Yeah. So Aristotle's claim is that all of life is filled with these twin tasks, yeah. rhetoric and dialectic. Right. Yeah. No, I certainly find myself doing that every morning trying to get my, my boys out of bed. Right. <laughs> right. It's you a, plead with them I, like Cicero, I, right? They, I, there's pleading. There's, right. there's logic. There is, there are cajoling. You cajole. Cajoling. There are minor threats. Okay. Right. Yeah. Bribes. Um, I try not to resort to that, but okay. in, in a pinch, you know, you gotta well, you're you a parent, do. you know, yeah. so bribes, right? <laughs> right. You, you plead with them on behalf of the Republic. Do you ever do that? Right. Oh, oh I, sh I, 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 I should go there. I mean, yeah, Cicero I did. Right. 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 So that's Aristotle's claim. Yeah. And therefore, he says it's subject to um, a kind of methodical investigation. Yes. Now, the two uh, key terms here are rhetoric and dialectic. So we're going to skip ahead to the character of Cicero. And in his Deofikiis, he mentions um, a very famous Greek, none of whose works survive, Demetrius of Phalerum. Okay. And Demetrius of Phalerum was famous for being both a philosopher and a highly regarded rhetorician. And this is, this is what Cicero is aiming at himself. Okay. You know, he wants to be seen as an orator who can also handle philosophy. Okay, yeah. Yep. So the metaphor is that um, dialectic, dialectic is a, a closed fist. That in dealing with people, dialectic is like getting punched or slapped in the face. You can't dispute the facts of the syllogism, right? Mm -hmm. If A, then B, A, therefore B, modus ponens, right? You, you can't right. argue with that. Yes. But rhetoric is the open palm, right? This is the metaphor that they used. Dialectic is for winning arguments by overwhelming your opponents with the evidence. Yes. Inescapable. And um, rhetoric is a different kind of um, communication. Gotcha. To win them over by, you know, sweet persuasion. Yes, yes, yes. So the, the best communicator combines those two. Gotcha, okay. Now is um so he's who is the the, the Demetrius of Phalerum right so who, whose works I'm assuming survived in his Cicero's day he had them yes oh he, yeah and uh, he quotes from them he okay. he gives his own Latin translations right. I think there are fragments in other authors uh, but any of his own original works lost and he was in that Hellenistic period between the death of Alexander what three twenty three something like that okay and um, the rise of Rome right now does Cicero see that um, him as a, a kind of a a go between between Aristotle and himself as kind of like this well, is someone who applied the things that Aristotle yes. was saying okay all right yeah at least in the De Officiis Cicero has a criticism a not unusual criticism of um, Socrates or of actually Plato saying that Plato was the first person to divorce rhetoric from dialectic. And um, Plato was more concerned about the tightness of his arguments mm -hmm. and their cogency and, you know, uh, validity and not so concerned about how properly to communicate those things to people. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And Cicero mm -hmm. believed, you know, I can hit the sweet spot. Right. I can do what they haven't done. So he says, uh, Demosthenes, if Demosthenes, it's a, it's a beautiful Latin sentence in De Figuis. If Demosthenes had wanted to be a philosopher, he would have, you know, just been at the very top of his game. Gotcha. Everyone would have uh, recognized his brilliance. Gotcha. On the contrary, if um, Plato had wanted to be a public speaker, 
he could have done that great. Right. But they unfortunately limited their fields of inquiry to one or the other. Yeah. And Cicero is going to combine them. Gotcha. Right. No, it's interesting. You know, there's the... Um there's the tradition about Plato is that he was a terrible public speaker, right? Right, and I, you know, that anecdote about um, I, I, almost certainly not true, but he was um, you know, so he starts this academy, but he seems he had no interest in actually right. like, speaking to the students. Okay, and he would read dryly from these notes. It was just, like, it was just pure <laughs> argument. I've been in lectures and, like that, and one of the exactly, one I've of the probably given lectures <laughs> like that. One of the, the kind of one of the punches of the of the anecdote is that he's Plato's deliberately trying to drive students away so oh, he doesn't yeah. deal with him. Right. And he's just reading from his notes and then when he looks up, you know, every student is left, but the one person left is Aristotle. Huh. And he's the one that stuck with it. Wow. <laughs> wow. I hadn't heard that story. I can't remember where I got that from. It was one of my grad professors yeah. told that. But Yeah, I have another story, uh, similar. My my father in law uh, was a professor of political science uh, mm. at a university in Florida for some 30 years. Just an extraordinarily hardworking, accomplished man. Yeah. Very, very impressive. And he told me once that when he would teach these graduate classes on uh, international relations or politics, the class would start out with 30, 35 people. And he would go to the front, piece of chalk, old school chalkboard. And he would say, okay, these are the books that you're going to need to read this semester. And he'd write a title up there. Okay, everybody's there. He'd write the second title, a couple of people would kind of, you know, filter out. He'd write the third title, some some more people. By the time he got to the end of the list of books that were required reading for the course, yeah, there were six, seven people left. Perfect. Yeah. And I mean, it was, you know, he told it with good humor. His point was kind of, right, I, he's kind of, I had the freedom in my classes to really make the students work hard. Yeah. And so the only ones who actually stayed were those who wanted to. So you, you weed them out on the very first Correct. day. Correct. Yeah. Now, I mean, there's in our own experience, I don't think we could have gotten away with that. No. By and large. But no, no. Oh, man, he, he, he lived in the glory days. Yeah, he did. <laughs> <laughs> so it starts with Aristotle mm-hmm. yeah, in terms of reflection on the art of rhetoric. Uh, but there are some other really significant names and um, two in particular. Cicero, of course, who not only wrote um, a you know, tremendous number of speeches and philosophical treatises, but wrote about the subject of oratory, mm-hmm. you know, how to be an orator, and then perhaps most famously Quintilian. Right, right, right. Uh, I think what's what are his dates like? A uh, hundred A.D. is that about when he uh, passed? I, I think that's right. Okay, yep. yep. So Quintilian is a good one hundred and fifty years distant from Cicero himself. Yes, that's right. But in Quintilian's mind, uh, Cicero is the gold standard. Correct, right? and, so, and I think he writes something uh, to that uh, to that view. Right. Yes, that's right. In okay. his uh, Institutes of Oratory. Right? Okay. His Institutio Oratoria. Oratoria, I think it is, mm-hmm. which you know wasn't a handbook of um, wasn't a handbook of models, right? Of great rhetoric that was Cicero, but it was carefully studied by subsequent generations in terms of methodology. Okay, all right. Um, you want to read a little bit? Yes, okay. I would like that. So this is from a book ten, uh, part one, and it goes like this: Quadre non in merito ab hominibus aetatis suae regnare in judiciis dictus est. Aper posteros vero id consecutus ut cicero, iam non hominis nomen, sed eloquenti ai habeatur. All right. And, what, and uh, give us a translation of that too. Yeah, so this, uh, this translation is the more recent Loeb translation, uh, Donald Russell, and he says this. It was not without reason that Cicero's contemporaries said he was the king of the courts, and that for posterity, Cicero has become not so much the name of a man, as a synonym for eloquence itself. Okay, that's pretty high praise. It is high praise. Right. Yeah, and I think it's deserved, yeah. right? We've talked before on the podcast when we did our, you know, our Stoic series on uh, De Natura Deorum and, you know, Cicero Falls at Formiae and some of the other Ciceronian episodes. Yes. Uh, the one that we did with um, uh, Professor Watts, right? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the Eternal Fall of Rome or something like that. Yeah. Um, how it is that Cicero's fallen on hard times uh, in the last... 50 years, probably. He doesn't have the respect he once had. Yeah. Uh, but I think for oratory, he's hard to beat. Gotcha. Okay. Yep. All right. So I think we should get into now, um, as we're nearing the halfway point of the episode, mm-hmm. what the ancients thought about, not dialectic, the formation of arguments, but rhetoric, the delivery of those arguments. Okay. Let's do it. Yeah, and what we have from Cicero is this famous line, and that is that the purpose of rhetoric is the purpose of any kind of communication actually is threefold. Docere, delectare, moere, which we could translate as uh, to inform, to entertain, and to 
persuade or motivate. That's what the moera is. It's not. That's correct. It, it, so not so much like to move like one emotionally. Is no, that, it's, it's more to. Kind no, of, it's to move them toward move the needle a goal. Gotcha. Exactly. Gotcha. To okay. get them to do something. Gotcha. And that's a very good distinction because sometimes you must move them emotionally in order to get them to do something. Exactly. But other times. Uh, an appeal to emotion is not going to work, right? Okay. So emotion is just one of the the tools that the orator has. So duquera, delectara, moera. Now I've reflected on this a lot, and I've tried to think for I don't know a couple decades. Not that my thinking is fruitful, but you know I've thought about it. Are there other potential um, goals of communication other than teaching, other than entertaining? and other than uh, persuading. And I have yet to find any. Hmm. So it seems to me that this is a, a fairly comprehensive and accurate description of the, the proper goals of communication. Okay, yeah. I mean, what do you think? You, you think about the, the communication that you engage in in the classroom right. and the kind that you receive, you know, maybe in the, in the church pew uh, when you're in many other places, right? Yeah. Well, what's your experience? Well, you know, as I, as I look at those three uh, you know, infinitives there, um, and, and I think about, like, you know, when I'm teaching in the classroom, I, I haven't, uh, as you have kind of thought uh, along those lines, you know, so where am I, where am I teaching? Where am right. I, where am I entertaining? Where, where am I persuading? But, you know, it just, as I'm just kind of just thinking about this is that I think that, you know, when I'm at my best, right. those three things are, yes. are in motion. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and that, you know, just off the top of my head, I like, I don't know what I would add to that. Mm -mm. Right. Mm -mm. I mean, I think there could be some like sub, I think sometimes, you know, to provoke, but, but couldn't that would, that'd be, that like would a, be kind of like Moera. Exactly, it should be a subset of Moera, right? right? Right. If by provoke you mean present your students with a, a shocking or you know a previously unconsidered fact, yes, so that they look at it with new eyes or they have a kind of you know, they they draw back from it uh, temporarily. Yeah, right. That's Moera. I think so. Yeah, I think so too. Right. Um, my experience is that the delectare part mm -hmm. to entertain to gratify is maybe a better way uh, to please. Most people don't think that's a, a proper part of education. And for that reason, I think this is not given adequate reflection. Some people I have met um, who either, you know, they fancy themselves good teachers. They don't put any effort into this. Right. In, into entertaining their audience. Students prize it. They love it. They love it. However, um, if you are good at it, which I know that you are, Jeff, quite entertaining, you can sometimes get the envy or contempt of your colleagues because it's easy to say, well, you know, you're just a popularizer. Right. right? You, you're only entertaining them. Where is the substance? Right. I don't think that's a very legitimate um, criticism. I don't either. Right. No, it's the, uh, um, I think it's a phrase that... Uh, that Apuleius uses, you know, so Apuleius um, was a was a rhetorician. He was a right. you know, he, he was a, a philosopher as well as a, a novelist. But he says that you know the best arguments should have um, you got to have to put the honey on the on the lip of the cup. That's correct. Before you take the medicine, right? Yeah, so, it's Lucretius too. Right, 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 right. Universal. Yeah, yeah. I was at a church event recently, and um, one of the individuals, and in, you know, in a very honest, wonderful individual, said. Um, I'm hoping someday that my knowledge of the scriptures, the Christian scriptures, is as good as my knowledge of pop lyrics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And uh, my claim here is not that the scriptures are not um, delectare, right? That they're not gratifying, because they are, mm -hmm. but not in the same way. Right. Certainly not in the same way as pop lyrics. Sure. Pop lyrics are memorable for different reasons than one might find the, the scriptures memorable. Right. And to just anticipate a little bit the end of the episode... This was really the issue for all um, Christian philosophers and uh, orators from the time of Cicero who were seeking to teach the scriptures. Yeah. How to um, retrain the palate of the audience so that they get the same kind of gratification from listening to the scriptures as they got from pagan literature. Sure. And therefore changed their appetite. Yes. From one to the other. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, one of the challenges that I think that um, I think probably you know, every every teacher, every speaker right. has is trying to thread that needle between um, the, the doquera, right. having authority, 
Right. But it's like, I am in. I know something. I know something. I'm the expert here. Right. And then, but Delectara can also it, it can bring you down to the, the you and the, oh, sure. to the same level, right? Right. And so you kind of you kind of show I'm not just this stuffy right. person up here that's right. kind of you know speaking from the heavens. Right. I'm one of you guys. Right. Um, but those things are often in, in tension with each they other. They can be right. Yeah. So the way I've tried to handle that is to uh, present myself as a student like like them. You know, yes, I am your teacher in title, but. I am simply a more advanced student Mm -hmm. and not necessarily advanced in um, intelligence or understanding. Right. Just in experience and time. I've been dealing with these things longer. So so that kind of delectara, it allows you to marvel at the content of what you're learning. Exactly. Right. Exactly. So I am equally impressed by the things that Homer can do in the Odyssey. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, that's really helpful as a teacher because... Sometimes the students are not impressed. Right. They, they don't have enough experience to really enjoy what you're explaining. So you have to model that for them. Exactly. So I think that's that's what I found. And what I found in my more positive like student um, evaluations will say that the uh, you know, Professor Winkle's enthusiasm for this right. is, is infectious. Yes. Right. And um, you, you've got to. And you, and you can't fake that. No. Right? They'll, they'll say, you know, I didn't really want to take this class. Yeah. But Dr. Winkle has convinced me that this stuff is great. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's, in some ways, that's better. And always, I would say, it's better than leaving the class with 500 well-known facts. Right. <laughs> totally. Any, anybody can do that. Yes. Yeah. More or less. But it's forgettable. Yeah, yeah. You know, it kind of reminds me, I don't know how apropos this is, but I'm going to say it anyway. Okay. Um, I, I remember... Um, when I lived in Chicago, I listened to lots of, of sports radio. Yeah. I'm not a huge sports fan, but for some reason, I like listening to people talking about sports. Especially and, when you're in a big city yes. with several professional teams. That it, makes a difference. Right. And I was there at the time where it was kind of the, you know, Michael Jordan and the, the Bulls. Bulls were dominating. And, and so it was a fun time to be there. Right. But I remember thinking, listening to is that this is very interesting, but I got the feeling that a lot of these guys... They, deep down, they hated sports. Really? Yeah, and it kind of came. Broadcasters. I mean, they were could be very funny and very snarky and very, you know, um, sarcastic, and it could be very, you know, laugh out loud kind of stuff. But you, I kind of walked away with the idea that they they kind of have contempt for the really? subject that they that they purport to love. Interesting. And, and it, it always kind of struck a, a weird note with me. Yeah. And so it, I picked it, up on that a little bit. Um, who who's the famous broadcaster on uh, NBA? Stephen something. He's a former player. Um, he's on ESPN and he's always talking about the NBA. Our, our listeners know who he is. I bet I recognize if, uh, if, uh, if Steven somebody. Yeah, okay, I, can't, okay. I can't remember. Okay, but yeah. you, you have the impression that he really hates basketball. <laughs> yes, exactly. Right. But he's so, he's so good at conveying the information because he was an insider and he knows everything about the game and the league. <laughs> right. But, but you think, are you really enjoying this? <laughs> yes. I don't think so. Yeah, exactly right. So that, I mean, that's exactly the kind of disconnect that I'm. That I think I hope that, you know if I get to a point where I'm doing that in the classroom, it's right. time. It's time to step down. Yes, yeah, for sure, right. for sure. So Duqueira de la Tara Moeira, I'm also going to make another controversial claim here. Okay, if I've made one thus far, All right. and that is, to my mind, many contemporary um, educators have inappropriately narrowed teaching to simply Moeira. Mm. Right. Mm -hmm. That the goal of teaching is primarily to get your students to do something. Yeah. I've heard this from many people. And I think that that is kind of the weakest link of these three, because um, teaching is very dangerous. If you're not sure that what you're trying to get your students to do and you're trying to push them toward, if you're not sure that's, you know, morally correct and good for them, Mm -hmm. then you're really, really destructive. Yeah. And uh, I've witnessed this a lot. Well, yeah, so so what if my facts aren't quite right? So so what if it's not really that engaging? I'm sharing with them, you know, a view of the world that they need to embrace. Yeah, so yeah. I'm, I'm talking about activism, right? Right, right. Whether it's activism on the left or activism on the right. Yeah. Moeira, you have to be extraordinarily careful with that. That's very true. Because the yeah. young minds, what, what are you going to drive them toward? Right, 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 exactly. Um, I mean, the way I always think about that, too, is like, I feel like my job is is not necessary to moera them in any particular direction, but to give them, try to give them the best tools to take the information, take the evidence, Correct. and then and then they can they can make the argument right. that they that they that as they see fit. Right. Sometimes right. I adopt just the very minimal goal in terms of moera. What do I want to persuade? I want to persuade them that this is important. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now maybe I can add a second thing if I'm really confident about you know, the moral and philosophical implications, it's important and they should think about it this way. 
Mm. But even that, you have to be careful because, you know, especially if you're teaching adults, uh, you know, I, I respect their agency and right. don't want to impose, of course. you know, a, a vision that may be tied to our particular moment in time. Yes. Yeah. And, and may not hold 75 years from now. Yeah, completely true. Yeah. yeah. So I'll, I'll cite here the postmodern philosopher um, Stanley Fish. Yes. Save the world on your own time. <laughs> You ever seen that book? Yeah. Is, was, is that the name of a it book? It is. Okay, yeah, yeah, it was recommended to me by a, a fairly progressive colleague at our former institution. Okay. I don't think that he thought, I don't think he agreed to the book at all. Right. But he said, hey, you sound like Stanley Fish. You should read this book. Okay, so I did. Save the world on your own time. Which yeah. He has three points. Do your job. Yeah. Right? So your job is teaching classics. Teach classics. Uh, don't try to do someone else's job. If you're teaching classics, don't try to teach psychology or mathematics. Yeah. Fairly simple. And don't let someone else do your job, which means sometimes you got to speak up and say, hold on, I'm the expert in this particular area. Yeah. And you can't have any say in this part. Right, right. But by the same token, I won't encroach gotcha. on your expertise. Save the world on your own time. Is it Now, was this a, a book that was geared towards academics or was it more just kind of... Yes, oh, it was geared toward academics. Okay. Yeah. And um, I don't know when it came out, um, late 90s. He was... Um, he was the dean of the School of Liberal Arts at the University of Chicago. So yes. he's trained as a lawyer, but he has a wonderful, he has, and a philosopher, but he has a, a wonderful liberal arts education. Yeah. And um, when, in the introduction of that book, I think it is, we should probably devote a whole episode to it. Yeah, sounds great. But when um, students or parents would ask him, uh, Professor Fish, you know, why should I read Plato? Where, where's the practical value of my reading Plato? Yes. His answer would be, well, have you read him? No. Okay, well, go read him and then come back and ask me that question. Until you know something about the subject, you have no right to raise the question. Interesting. Now that, I mean, that's like cold water in the face. Yes. Yeah. But I think he's basically right. Right. No, I, I would agree with that too. Is, uh, is, um, is Fish still, is he still above I think ground? He's, I think he's living down in Florida. Okay. He's yeah, retired. After, and, yeah. After yeah. I read a half dozen of his books or so, or maybe yeah. only three or four, um, I, I tried to get in touch with him. Yeah. Which I kind of like to do and... No response. Okay. I mean, he's a big, he's a big fish, so to speak. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Yeah. But uh, that thesis, you know, puts the Moeira in proper context. It does. You just don't go around telling people what to do because you're convinced. Right. 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 At least that's my perspective. Right. One thing I, I thought of that, I mean, we could probably, this would be, you know, we could, you know, um, you know, categorize it under, you know, one of these three too, but the... Um, and I'm just curious if you know if uh, Quintilian or Cicero talks about the visual aspects, you know, the of giving speech, of giving a speech. Of what yes. are you doing with your hands? You know, how are yes. you posing? Oh, we're going to get to that. Okay, great. We're going to get to that, okay. baby. You oh. better believe it. All right, all right. All right. So three types of speeches. Then let's get down to the nuts and bolts, the, let's do it. the nitty and gritty. Mm -hmm. The three uh, genres of speech giving are the genus demonstrativum, right? Okay. So this is the genre of the demonstrative or the epideictic sort of uh, rhetoric. Okay. And this always has two different goals, either blame or praise. All right. Vituperatio is blame and laudatio is praise. All right. Now, the best example of this that I uh, have found is actually from American history, and that is uh, Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. All right. So 90 seconds, delivered July 4, 1863, something like that. Mm -hmm. Apparently wrote it on the back of an envelope while he was on the train. Yes, I've heard that. Yeah. Yes. It, it's not trying to move the audience in any particular direction other than to appreciate the fallen dead. Yes. Um, and its sole purpose is to praise the fallen dead. Yes. To honor the heroes on the battlefield. Yes. Um, I don't think we have hardly any examples of a vituperatio or blame type of um, oratory in contemporary culture, with the exception maybe of stand-up comedians. Ah, I see. What yeah. do you think? Well, I was going to say that you know the vituperatio that would that would be something that I think contemporary culture would say. Well, you don't you don't do that. You can't do you that. You can't do that. It's right? cruel. Right. We don't want we don't want anger and and you know and uh, you know vicious accusations coming from our our. our but what if they're true? Well, I mean, what if the person is reprehensible in some aspect? Yeah. Should they be publicly shamed by a capable and witty orator? Yeah. So as to. Um, try to disincentivize such behavior. Right. I think you're right. I think that's, that's our culture would say that's the job of the comedian. It's yeah. not the job of the politician anymore. No. Right. I, I don't know. Aristophanes did it. Yeah. Right. A, a comedian, but he did it brilliantly and he made fun of every target in Athens. Right. And uh, it's like the roast, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe what is it? The, um, uh, the, the, the White House press corps, 
Oh yeah, they have a dinner. Yeah, it was. Just, they just recently had it. And they yeah. usually bring a, 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 in a comedian, a comedian to, to roast the president. Yes, exactly. At least that's that's expected. That the that's right. the, that's part of the job of the comedian is to right. is to kind of aim the the, the cannons at the people yes. in the room. And my impression has been that when the when the president is a Republican, then the Republicans uh, complain. That the roast was mean spirited. Yeah. And when the president is a Democrat, then the Democrats complain that the roast was mean spirited. <laughs> That's been my experience. Right. Uh, but vituperatio, right? Uh, heaping blame on your object. That's uh, one part of the genus demonstrativum. Okay. All right. Epideictic oratory. And you know that um, aspiring orators uh, in the past, in Greece and Rome, they were assigned these um, practice speeches called swasorii. And in these swasoria, these practice speeches, they were supposed to pick, they were supposed to pick um, a character, often it was a historical character, and either give them blame or praise. I see, right. And sometimes they were supposed to do both. Right. A famous one was with, with Helen, right? Yes. Oh, yeah, was the, the she t- yeah. Can we blame her for, for starting? Right, 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 right. So in our context, right, um, perhaps Washington should not have crossed the Delaware on Christmas morning and attacked the British, yes. right? So heaping vituperatio on him, right? <laughs> or maybe laudatio, the men at Valley Forge during the winter, which is about the same time, right? Yeah. Uh, praising their courage and their fortitude. Right? Yes, yeah, This yeah. is the kind of thing gotcha. that was the, you know, the set practice speech. Right, All right, right, right. Yeah. The second type um, is the genus judiciale. All right. This is judicial oratory, and it always has one of two objects, guilt or innocence. Mm-hmm. I would say the vast majority of rhetoric in American culture today is this kind. Okay. It's courtroom rhetoric. Yes, yes, yes. And um, it was different for the ancients, as we've talked about before, because if you could prove that the person was morally corrupt in some way, then it was a quick step to saying they were guilty of you know a particular crime. Yes. Um, that would not hold up in a court today. No, right. Uh, you can't judge a person by their character. You have to demonstrate the facts. At least that's the claim. Yeah. Uh, but a lot of oratory is spent in this one area, guilt or innocence, you know, the judicial kind. Okay. All right. And then there's a third kind. The third kind is the genus deliberativum, deliberative oratory. And this is when you are either trying to uh, affirm or negate, affirm or deny a particular proposition. So uh, we should, as an Athenian body, body politic, we should uh, undertake an expedition to Sicily. Mm-hmm. Let's all sail to Sicily. It'll be easy pickings, right? We'll defeat the Spartans there, yeah. and we'll come back uh, having expanded our empire. Right. That's the affirmative, right? Yes. Or, you know, maybe Demosthenes. We should not league up with Philip. You know, he's a crook. He's a criminal. He's not even Greek. He's a barbarian. We must not do that, right? Yes, yes, yes. And so um, all public oratory today, it seems like, is of this kind, the political kind of oratory. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know, we should support... Uh, uh, Ukraine against Russia, we should not support you know, fossil fuels, whatever the, the right. thing is. Yes, yes. Uh, so it's either affirming or negating some particular proposition. Excellent. So just to kind of keep this all kind of uh, organized, um, the perp- these these verbs for purpose, the docera, delectara, you would That's use, right. use all three in any type of exactly. these Exactly, okay. in one of these three types. Gotcha. And the next thing we're going to get into uh, is the five canons themselves. All right. But Dave, speaking of cannons, yes, it's time for the ads. This episode of Ad Nauseum is brought to you by Ratio Coffee. Jeff, what can we say about Ratio Coffee that we haven't already said? I don't know if we can do that. The, the number of superlatives that we've we have uttered over the last uh, you know months and years, right? I think speak for themselves. But, yes, I mean, I mean, all I can really say is yes. that uh, this morning. I pushed the button on my ratio yes. eight, and it went through the three stages, the bloom, the brew, and the ready. That's all you can say? And I had a perfect cup of coffee <laughs> waiting for me, right? But what, what, more, what more is there to say? Uh, I can say something very similar. This morning, yes. I ground my beans in my Barazza burr grinder. Yes. The setting was on 21, thanks to the good folks at Ratio. Excellent. I put the beans into the cone. I put the cone under the Fibonacci shower head. Yep. I pushed the button. Yes. I waited for the... Scalding hot water, which I didn't have to encounter personally yes. or tangentially. Thank goodness. 
yes. come up coursing through the metallic veins. Yep. There's only one piece of plastic in the entire machine. Is that right? There's a tiny little silicone nib where the water leaves the Fibonacci heads. Okay. And that is to prevent rust. It's a brilliant, brilliant introduction. Otherwise, it's all rugged, uh, durable kinds of materials. Yes, this this machine would uh, uh, would stand up to a tank. That's correct. Um, if you they could, were to go head to head, yes. Yeah, you could drag it behind your uh, vehicle as you're going down the road, and it would be successfully brewing while you're dragging <laughs> exactly it. Exactly right. Yeah. I, we, we don't, uh, uh, no, no, don't we, do that. we don't recommend it. No, but, no, of course not. But you could. Not. Right. right. Now, it might have some deleterious consequences for the... Hand blown borosilicate glass, possibly, possibly, yes, exactly right. So I, I would say to our listeners, yes, that um, I mean these things are they are built to last. Yep. Um, yes, in terms of the price point, it's going to be more than what you're going to pay for your right. your, your senior um, cafe, your, right? Your Dak and Blecker, exactly right. But these things are going to last a very very long time. Right. They look great. They're beautiful. Uh, do yourself a favor. Go to ratio r a t i o c o f f e e ratiocoffee.com. Check out these machines, the right. six or the eight, yep. and look at all their under, other wonderful um, things they have to offer there. And if you want one of them, put it in your little grocery basket. And right. what's our code that we put in for? It's uh, ANCO3 flavor. Three flavor. The, three, flavor. Three F. F. Three F. Three F, F as in flavor. For the month of May, mm-hmm. AN ad nauseum, CO coffee, three as in more than two but less than four. Yes. F. F. And that will get you 15% off your entire order. That's correct. And the opportunity to support this humble podcast. Which we very much appreciate. What you will not get in the package that they send you is... Um, brackish tang. tang. Exactly. N- yeah, a no scorch one- pad. No. A Kindle brick. None, none of that stuff. No. Exactly. Maybe a hulking flagon. Yeah, maybe a hulking fra- flagon made out of borosilicate uh, hand-blown glass. That's right. Check it out. This episode of Odd Nauseam is also brought to you by the good folks at Hackett Publishing. Hackett, these guys have been with us from almost the very beginning, Yes, right? it was fall of 2020. Wow. So right there at the start. Right. I think we were uh, naive enough to maybe put out three episodes when we first uh, hit 500 downloads. We thought we were the Joe oh, Rogan we, of classics. We did, but we were just kind of, we were right. we were, we were Neanderthals just rubbing sticks together. That's right. There, right. We <laughs> called them up. Hello, is this Hackett <laughs> um, podcast sponsor? Yeah. but And to our great delight right. and surprise, they said, Hey, we'll take a chance at you. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and um, and then what, the reason that we called them is both of us had been using oh. um, uh, books from class from Hackett Publishing for a number of years in, our, in the classroom, right? And in our, in, and our myth courses, our classical lit courses, our our language courses, right? And so we we knew that they they put out great stuff. Um, one of the things that I've always liked about them is they are books that are um, penniless students can right. readily afford. Yes. Um, uh, they're good looking. The translations are accurate. They give you lots of choice. Um, mm-hmm. um, good notes as well. Good notes. Um, so this seems like a perfect a perfect fit, and it's been great all along the way. Mm-hmm. So what else could you say about Hackett? That Well, uh, some of the textbooks from Hackett that I used as a student, I then used as a professor as well. Mm-hmm. And so there's a great amount of longevity uh, to these translations. Yeah. And the website is easy to navigate. Uh, they are supporting the classics, and for this, I'm I'm really deeply grateful. Right, they're, they're the real deal. So, if you want to support a company that is supporting the classics, and then by extension, um, supporting us in our humble little podcast, uh, go to hackettpublishing.com. That's H A C K E T T publishing.com. Um, go through their vast catalog. It's not just classics; they got stuff from all over um, the uh, the world of academia, South American studies, Asian studies, Islamic Islam. studies, yep, everything. Um, find the books that you want. Um, put them in the, the satchel, and our coupon code is AN2023. And that will get them, uh, that will get you, dear listener, 20% off your entire order and free shipping. Check it out. All right, Dave, as we get back into it, mm-hmm. um, you're going to tell us about these five canons. That's right. And I want to help the listener here, especially if you are a teacher of rhetoric, as some of you may be. Perhaps you know this, perhaps it's no helps, just review. Five canons, remember, dialectic is the closed fist yes. of the forceful syllogism. Rhetoric is the... The open hand. The open hand of gentle persuasion, yes. right? Now, uh, most of us have five fingers on that hand, which can be either uh, closed with dialectic or opened as the palm of rhetoric. Five fingers, five canons. It's a built-in mnemonic device. Nice. Really helpful. The first one is inventio or inventio. Inventio is the discovery of topics and arguments. Cicero wrote a whole essay on this very topic, invention, how to find your material for your speech. Okay. All right. 
Now, just before we we get yes. into this, uh, as we go through the five canons, this is as I take it, this is not um, set up. Like, this is the order in which you introduce things. These are just these are just five elements that make up a a successful speech. No, the, this is the order. It's the order. So you yes. do these things as you're speaking. No, no, no. But this is the we'll get to the actual speech, which is the second canon. Okay. But these are the five elements in order of all that goes into okay. being an orator. Okay. Okay. I just want to make right. that clear. Okay. That's a good question. Yep. So in Inventio, we start out with Logos. That's the first the first kind of content for your speech is Logos. These are reasoned arguments, including syllogisms like modus ponens, modus tollens, disjunctive syllogisms, so forth, and enthememes. Enthememes? Yeah. What's an enthememes? Enthememes. That's something you spread on your uh, windshield in the winter, and it helps de-ice oh, yeah, in exactly. the Michigan it's environment. It's useful stuff, right. What does that have to no, do with Well, that? in Aristotle's <laughs> Art of Rhetoric, an entheme is an informal syllogism. Okay. It's that kind of intuitive... Yes, I grasp the point that you're making, but you don't have to spell it out in a kind of formal propositional way. Yeah. So most of rhetoric and most argumentation, says Aristotle, is enthememes, not syllogisms. Okay. All right. And I think he's right. All right. All right. Uh, second after logos is pathos. All right. Appeals to feeling. Now, people, I would say, they tend to um, play this down quite a bit, but it is so common in all kinds of human interaction. Mm-hmm. Right. You only kind of notice that someone is appealing to feeling if the appeal seems inappropriate. Oh, yeah. You, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, I think I do know what you're saying. If, yeah. if you if it's an appropriate appeal, you don't even notice it because, well, of course, I should yeah. feel this way and therefore act in you know a way that's consistent. Right, right. But if someone doesn't like the argument, they say, oh, well, you know, that's an appeal to emotion. It's not really a good um, objection because there are good emotions and bad emotions, right. you might say. Right, right, right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, just kind of that that just that dismissal because right. it's an appeal to emotion. Therefore, it's it's um, devoid of right. of substance. Yeah. And Aristotle would say, in fact, this is probably the strongest of the four kinds of invention or discovery hmm. is pathos. Okay. The third one is ethos appeals to character. All right. And again, this is very different than the um, the ancients. So with the ancients, an appeal to character, you know, sealed the deal. Why is Catiline bent on um, revolution? Uh, because he is a drunkard and uh, incestuous. It's right? a bad seed. He's a bad seed. Yes. And that's right. And such a person, of course, is going to do bad things. That yeah. doesn't work today. No. But mm-hmm. another part of ethos is the auctoritas, the dignity of the speaker. This still has a lot of value, I would say, today. Because um, if a person is tall, like mm-hmm. every president except Madison, tall, Tall president, tall people tend to be more persuasive. It's true. They stand out in a crowd, yeah. right? Um, also, if you know something about the history of the speaker, you know, they might be speaking on some totally unrelated subject to their own history, mm-hmm. you know, but are, are you more likely to buy a hamburger from a war hero or from, you know, someone who is kind of a nobody? Right, right, right. Yeah. What, what, what does being a war hero have to do with? you know, choice in hamburgers, but yeah, that kind of thing works with people right? because of the auctoritas of the individual. Sure. I mean, you think about, um, you know, I'm not, I won't speak about you know, any specific individuals, but you know, someone who within the culture has, for whatever reason, a lot of moral authority. Right. And then one indiscretion comes to light. Correct. And for many people, it's that just, that wipes, that, that wipes them out. That That's anything it. they have ever said, sure. therefore is tainted. Yeah. Sure. Their auctoritas is completely gone. Right. Yep. Uh, do you remember the George Foreman grill? I do. Speaking of hamburgers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Uh, I don't know if George Foreman knows anything about um, how to make and sell, you know, meat burning appliances. Yes. Meat cooking appliances. Right. But he was such a successive salesman for that thing. Yes. It went through the roof. Right. In terms of, and I don't know why, because he well, was impressive as an athlete. He was tall. And he's yes. also, he's also very charming. Yes. Right. He has he's kind physically of, impressive. Physically impressive. But he also, he was also very kind of... Um, I mean, he kind of reminds me of, you know, do you know Charles Barkley? Oh, yeah, I think sure. Charles Barkley has a similar kind of thing. He's a big guy. He has lots of kind of physical authority. Right. Um, he was great at his sport. Right. But he's also very charming and very funny. Right, yeah. right. I, I agree. Yeah. But I think it was rare that Foreman said, buy this grill because its features will help you become like me. There was a little bit about, you know, it's low fat and such. Yes, yeah, it yeah. It was mostly just... I like this guy, yes, right? Of course. He's a likable person. Yeah. I want to own a product he's selling. Yes. That's Octoritas. Yes. The last one in Inventio is the Atechnoipistes. 
All right. This means the facts, the pistes, the persuasive things without any art applied. You know, the unadorned proofs. Just the facts, man. Just the facts, ma'am. Yes. And this is listed last on purpose because it is the least important of the four. Okay. All right. I right. think of the you know, think of the hack lawyer, you know, giving his closing speech. Yes. If he has a lost case, he spends no time on the facts whatsoever. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. It's all appeals to feeling. Would my client, this kind of person, do this sort of thing? Yes. You know, would you, the jury, such nice people, want to convict such an, an innocent-looking individual? That's right. You're going to tell me that none of you have ever thought about exactly. this? Right? Exactly. It's all irrelevant, <laughs> right. <laughs> but that's what you do, and that's all you've got. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so for the ancients as well, the unadorned proofs were not very um, significant that's in their, really in their cases. Hmm. This is why when many people read ancient rhetoric, they have this response of, well, this is garbage. Yeah. It's because they're looking for the wrong thing. They have a, a different set of um, preconceptions. Gotcha. Okay. All right. So the next thing, you got, you've got your inventio, you got your material together. Mm -hmm. Now you're ready to compose the speech. Okay. So this is the dispositio or the collocatio, the arrangement of material. All right. And it begins with... The exordium. The exordium, the introduction. And this has to have... A captatio benevolentiae, the capture of goodwill. You, you open with a joke. You open with a joke. Yes. You do something that is self-deprecating. Right. A, a really wise thing to do when you have to give a speech is that as you're walking to the podium, trip, <laughs> fall. <laughs> you don't don't do it in a way that's foolish. Yeah. But look like you were made the victim, you know, of some ridgy carpet or something like that. Yes. And then show how you can have incredible dignity despite this hardship that, you know, fortune dealt you. Right. Then you straighten your tie or whatever it is and you begin to give the speech. Yes. Now you've got their goodwill, right? Yeah, right. Exactly. Or you identify with them some way, right? Exactly. So here we are at the convention hall. Boy, it's humid outside, isn't it? It's really hard to keep your, you know, your clothes pressed in this humidity. Right. Right. Look, like we were talking about you kind of, you make yourself human and you kind of, Correct. you connect with the audience. Now that, that the instance of, of, um, when you, when you use kind of the, the, um, the example of self-deprecation, um, well, do you think that was a, a live thing in antiquity as well? Yeah. Really? You think it's so? not, not like today. Yeah. And I think it's in part because humility did not used to be the virtue that it is. Yes. That's, that's kind know, of what I'm in getting In the Christian at. era. Right, right. But not all, not all self-deprecation is humble and or vice versa. Yeah. So I think you could be kind of self-deprecating. I, I do think you find this in the orators. What we might right? call today like a humble brag. Correct. Yes. I'm not really worthy to be in front of such an audience of yeah. you know, distinguished senators. But here I am anyway. But here I am. Yeah, right. You may not really believe it, but the audience doesn't care if it's true. They like the effort. Yeah. Okay. They like the recognition, you know, that this speaker realizes he's doing something difficult mm -hmm. and he's trying to get our goodwill. Yes. So it's really important. Okay. All right. After that, you go on to the narratio. This is the discussion of the events. This is where your style as a storyteller really comes through. And this is the setup, right? It would be in, in a plot, the exposition, right? Mm -hmm. So what am I doing here today, ladies and gentlemen? Well, you'd be surprised. I got here because, and then you lay out the case, right? Gotcha. But yep. what is my client doing here? Right? Why is, why is Milo here? Why am I defending Milo for the murder of Clodius? Yes. Uh, here's what happened. And you, you spend a lot of time on that, and it's got to be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Then you go to confirmatio. I would say that this is the only part, really, of speech making that we think about today. This is where you actually make the case, the confirmatio. You, you confirm it, right? So this is where you're saying the, um, the uh, evidence that I gather, gathered in the inventio, right. this is what it means. This is where you place it, and this is what it means. Okay. Here are the syllogisms and the enthymemes, right? right. And so I think most um, people who uh, are public speakers, they spend a lot of time on this. Yeah. I would say the really successful ones spend more time on the other elements because the facts are usually not as persuasive as people think. Right. It's the other things that, that win approval. Right. After that, uh, refutatio. This is fun. So this is where you anticipate and you overcome your opponent's objections. Right. So why should we, you know, not invade? Where's a place we'd like to invade? Ontario? Do we want yeah, to invade oh, Ontario? I mean, it's long overdue. You think so? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> With all their Tim Hortons and their difficult border crossings. They're, they're and back bacon and their skating. Back bacon? I don't know anything about okay, that. Well, oh, it's Canadian bacon. Yeah, exactly. Oh, right, right, right. right, right. <laughs> and their hockey and yeah. 
Yeah. We've Don't been, get me started. Don't. No. <laughs> right. Uh, so some of you may be saying we shouldn't invade Ontario. There are our kindly neighbor to the north and it will be sorry if we do. But <laughs> nice. here's why you're wrong. Right. There's the refutatio. Yes. And this is so effective. You, you have to th- try to think like your opponent. Mm-hmm. What is my opponent thinking and how can I disarm it? Yes. And here's where you get to control their thinking by phrasing their objections for them. Right. Once you phrase the objection in a memorable way, they can't really um, argue successfully against it. Right. At least as an audience. Yeah. Right. I mean, the, the, the handful of times where I've had the misfortune of stumbling upon C-SPAN. Right. This is all the time. There's always uh, there's always a, a, right. a guy up there saying, now my esteemed colleague from Connecticut right. is going to tell you. Right. Right. You know, <laughs> every time. Yeah. Yeah. Going to tell you that uh, their maple syrup is better than <laughs> Vermont. Right. Right. <laughs> but. But here's why he's wrong. Exactly. Right. After the refutatio, which can sometimes be as long as the confirmatio. Right? Mm-hmm. Then you have a digressus. Okay. You have a short digression. This is uh, a tangent, right? Usually it has nothing to do with the subject. The, f- the further removed, the better. Okay. And the reason is that by this time, the audience is exhausted. Gotcha. They're, they're starting to get fatigued. They're looking at their watch, right? They, they want to pour a cup of coffee. Right. And so, get me out of here. Get me out of here. Yeah. So in the digressus, you give an altera captatio, a second uh, capture of goodwill. You got to make an effort to get their goodwill back. So okay, so it's kind of like you have the the two joke pieces of bread, yeah, and then the the, uh, the confirmatio and the refutatio, kind of the meat in the sandwich. I haven't heard that before. Okay, I'm just coming off of the top of my head. Really? Yeah, okay. You just came up with that sandwich <laughs> right, thing? Right. Exactly. Right. Let's talk about sandwiches a little more. Uh, oh, I would love to talk about. No, it. that's we a digression. We don't have time. We don't, right. Exactly. Yeah. It's right. got to be humorous, right. tangential, and you want to get their goodwill again. Why? Because you're about to go into the closing lap. And you got to make the sale, right? Yes, exactly. Now, it reminds me, we, we've talked about um, a number of times, uh, like, theories of humor, like, what makes something funny. Right. And we've talked about how, like, the callback. Yes. Right? When you, when you, something, you, something is, is mentioned and, it, and it's kind of funny, but then you really hit the punch later was when you kind of unexpectedly right. uh, bring that back. David Letterman was the king of that kind of yeah, stuff. Robert Mack is pretty good at that, Robert too, Mack, who we, who, we, who we interviewed, is great yeah. at that. Yep. And so it starts with that, maybe that one way you could think of how the digressus relates to the exordium. Is right. You kind of bring them back to something a little bit exactly. humorous and funny to, to kind of, oh, right. now, they're, now they're with me again. Right, yeah. right. So, you know, remember how I tripped and fell on the way to the podium yeah. a few hours ago, ladies and gentlemen, and even if it was only 20 minutes, get them to laugh. Right. Well, I'm not going to do that, but etc. And then you get into the peroratio. Now, this actually survives into English as peroration, mm-hmm. that, that word, but nobody uses it. And here is where you summarize what you've done real briefly. You tell the people why it's important, and then you tell them what to do. Yeah. You make the sale. So for epideictic, you know, the first kind or um, the genus demonstrativum, you're telling them, here is why you must hate the person I've been describing. Yes. Here is why you must love the person I've been describing. Mm -hmm. Same for the judicial and the deliberative. Gotcha. All right, so that's the second canon. We've got three more canons, but these go fast. Okay, let's do it. So the third one is style, right? So you've got your topics, you arrange your speech, now what's your style going to be? And you have three options here. Okay. And we have, um, see, uh, tenuous is first. Yes. Because of thin. This is the thin now, or why, the lean why style. Would, okay, the, I hear tenuous, I hear thin. That doesn't sound complimentary to me. So it, means, it just means, it's just more just kind of like just the facts? No, it That's, has more to do with the complexity of your sentences. Okay. And whether there's subordination or whether you are just trying to lay it out with simplicity. All right. So there's there's something pleasing and charming about simplicity. Mm-hmm. Uh, although, you know, you need variety at some points. But each one of these... Uh, is described is used to describe the way a river flows right okay. so that's the metaphor the tenuous style is like a slender stream right? right it doesn't rush through the landscape sweeping everything in its path it's a metaphor for for rhetoric right yes. it just kind of winds its way carefully it picks its way around obstacles yes. you know the big boulder the outsized tree and eventually it it reaches its destination in a gentle kind of way that's the that's the thin or lean uh, style. Okay. All right. And this would be demonstrated by such persons as the Attic orator Lysias or the Roman orator Seneca. Okay. Now, any good orator could function in any of these registers. They practiced. Here's my speech in the lean style. Okay. Right? Respect the men who fell at Gettysburg. Sincerely, Abraham Lincoln. Yes. You know, that's it. Now, but, would related to this is... Um, 
would would this be also kind of your your tone, your loud, your soft? Is that is that those would play in? in this? Yes, okay. definitely. But that comes down more to pronunciatio. But okay. that's a very astute observation because the style and the delivery are going to be connected. Yeah, there's a certain modesty that goes with the tenuous style that isn't appropriate for the um, swollen style. Okay. Huh. The second one in between is the temperatus, the moderate style. And you have written here, this is where most people would fall. Most people would fall okay. if they were naturally to write a speech. It, it wouldn't have the careful polish of the lean style where there's no word out of place and there aren't any extra words. Yes. This would be a mixture of kind of casual, easygoing diction and then also occasionally you know, pointed remarks and then some things that are swollen. Gotcha. And so this is Cicero, this is, I'm sorry, this is Caesar, this is Isocrates, okay. the Attic Order at times. And then the third one is what we generally think of as classical rhetoric. And this is a misnomer, a misunderstanding. You've seen these memes on uh, Facebook and other places. It's an old joke. I've been listening to Cicero for 15 minutes and he still hasn't gotten to the verb. Yes, I've right. seen it, yes. It is true that some of Cicero's sentences are extraordinarily long and complicated, it's also true that some of Cicero's sentences are extraordinarily brief and simple, hmm. sometimes three words. And uh, it's because he knew how to move in all three registers. He could be simple, he could be moderate, or he could be swollen, yeah. like expansive. Yeah, 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 yeah. And this is Cicero and Demosthenes. Hmm. Okay. So how do you achieve the grand style? You've got to have lots of figures of speech. Okay. And you got to include all of your brachiologies and your hippolage and your hyperbole and your litotes and all, you know, there's some 40 different figures of speech hmm. in standard use. And you wouldn't, you wouldn't master these and you'd know these and you would include them at strategic points. This is what Haddis was saying about Cicero wrote according to the numbers, right? Formulae. You just, you just deployed those where they belonged. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it was a pattern, right? Right. It's kind of like um, playing an instrument. Yeah. Uh, or playing chess or something. Yes. Everyone knows the rules. Everyone follows certain patterns. The great ones follow the patterns in unexpected ways. Exactly, right. I think that's where, I mean, just the whole element of of feel comes in, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, that, um, I mean, to... Well, what was I think what's very appealing about all of this is that, okay, this gives me a checklist, right? Exactly. This gives me kind of a roadmap, but... You, you, everybody's got to get to a point where you either have the X factor or you don't. Correct. Right. So you could imitate Cicero. Right. But if you didn't have kind of that natural, you know, God given gift. Right. You're not going to be Cicero. Right. Well, that's, it's very um, interesting that you say that because to skip ahead to the 16th century, our man Erasmus yeah. was engaged in a protracted debate against the Ciceronians, wherein he basically said, all of you Renaissance scholars want to write like Cicero, but you're just basically going by the numbers you're not real artists it's paint by the numbers yeah. that's all you can do yeah, yeah, yeah. you know that cicero would have used this trope here you know so you dip into that color and because there's a six on the page you color that part of your speech with you know the six color and then over there you color it with the four color and then you've done these paint by numbers yes i remember that right yeah and so erasmus was just disgusted with this kind of rote following of the system interesting but i mean it wasn't really fair I would say for him to think anyone can be as as clever as the man himself, Cicero. Right. People have to have something to learn, you know, the structure. Yeah. I guess if if he was, you know, really against somebody who was doing this and then claiming yeah. to be as kind of as elevated as Cicero himself, well, then he might have a case. But I think that's partly what he was doing. Okay. Was yeah. saying, you, you all think you're Ciceronian. But you're not. But you're just, you know, slavish imitators. You know? Yes. Or did I say that right? Or is it slavish? Um, I prefer slavish. Let's I've go never, with slavish. I've never known. I think I want to go either way. Okay. Yeah. You're just slavish imitators. You're not real artists. Yeah. All right. Okay. So you got to have figures of speech, polarity, chiasmus, parallelism. That makes the grand and expansive the swollen style. Okay. All right. Two more canons. All right. Memory. The whole speech has got to be memorized. No. The whole speech. No note cards. No note cards. Okay. If you are tied to your notes, you are not engaged with the audience. So then what you were talking about how that teleprompter maybe killed the art of oh, oratory. Oh, it kills it. And then that, that, that goes, that, that right. wipes out this canon. You're right. Yeah. You're right. And you've seen the, you know, the funny clips where a, a given politician is reading from the teleprompter and all of a sudden he reads something like, end line here, you know, or <laughs> bracket, bracket, right. wait a minute. Remove glasses, look concerned. Right. <laughs> uh, these guys memorized, uh, and they use these memory palace, memory palaces. 
Oh, we should refer them back to an episode. We should. Of ours, Which right? one was that, Jeff? That was the, that was uh, Ad Nauseum eighteen. I eighteen. Believe. Cranks for the memories. Yes, uh, right. William Perkins in the Art of Memory, and last, Pronuntiatio. All right. Delivery. Delivery has two parts. Okay. It has your voice, the walks, and it has the corpus, the body. Now, the voice, uh, we could maybe read a little anecdote here about um, Demosthenes, if we have time, or about Cicero. Uh, but we could also get on to the fact that not only did you have to have a good voice, but your body had to be right. And this included your posture, the status, uh, gestus, your gestures, and your expressions, your face. Okay. So that's, this is where the visual element comes in. Exactly. Okay. Right. And uh, which of the, the different parts of the body do you think the ancients believed were the most successful in persuasion? Uh, I would say the face and the hands. No. What, um, really? The eyes. Eyes. Well, yes. that's, that's part of the face part. Okay, fine. <laughs> right. But this has always struck me as very odd. The eyes. Okay. The eyes are hard to see at a distance. Yeah. I would think that the hands, you know, the stereotype of, of Mediterraneans exactly. who, who talk with their hands. Exactly. And maybe that's true, but the hands were not the most persuasive part of the orator. It was his eyes. If you could see his eyes, if he could persuade you with the eyes and the, the great expressiveness of the eyes, even more than the voice, really, you won them over. That's fascinating. Yeah. So Plutarch says of Cicero that when he stood in front of the Roman masses, uh, you know, lightning came from his fingertips. Yeah. And the whole Roman people swayed back and forth in rhythm to what he was saying. <laughs> he had him in the palm of his hand. Isn't that incredible? That is incredible. In the pupil of his eye, yes. you might say. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, Dave, we're, we're up against it. Yes, we are getting there. Uh, so um, you, you want to you have some things you, you want to maybe wrap this up with? Um, um, you want to review the canons? Well, or, or... I, I don't think that's necessary. I mean, we've got the five canons. Yeah. We've talked about dialectic and rhetoric and, you know, the five uh, different canons. If anyone out there is teaching classical rhetoric in a school or something like that, I'd be happy. Contact me. I'll send you, you know, some of the notes here that I've got so you can maybe use some of these in your own classroom. Great idea. found it very helpful for me. Yeah. But Dave, before we go, did you want to say a couple things about uh, Christian rhetoric? Well, I did. I thought this would be a, a good place to end, maybe. And I just want to mention two things. Uh, a few years ago, I, I read this great um, monograph, this great book, by a guy named A. Dwayne Litfin. Okay. And um, it's called St. Paul's Theology of Proclamation, 1 Corinthians 1 through 4, and Greco-Roman Rhetoric. Now, this is a fantastic book because what he does is he, he takes uh, the first four chapters of 1 Corinthians where, uh, as you know, Paul is in Corinth and he's saying, you know, that everyone here has such fancy, refined Greek rhetoric. When I came here, I determined to know nothing except Christ and him crucified. So I deliberately laid aside all of those canons of classical rhetoric to speak to you in a different way. Hmm. And uh, Litfin, uh, Litfin, excuse me, examines this uh, really brilliantly. And he shows that although Paul moved in a, in a Greco-Roman rhetorical world, he deliberately eschewed it and decided, I'm not going to speak like that. Interesting. And that's interesting because ever since the time of Cicero, how are um, apologists and preachers trained? Um, Melanchthon's handbooks, all the handbooks of the 16th century, Augustine, they were trained to be classical orators right. and then to add something to it or do something a little bit different. Yes. And I think that the Litfin book is just a, a fantastic entry to that whole discussion. Well, that sounds like the subject of a future episode. I think it could be. Right. Yeah, well, I, I think you know. I think we got um, we got a lot of seeds here. We do a lot of uh, future stuff. I, mean, I would love at some point to look at a specific speech of Demosthenes or Cicero Correct. and kind of see how these rules play out. Yes. Um, but this is this has been great. But we do have to we do have to wrap things up. Can I say one more thing? One more thing. Okay. Yeah. Please. Okay, yeah. All okay. right. Uh, and that is, docere delectara moera. Yes. Yep. The, uh, the 16th century reformer Heinrich Bullinger, mm. who was in Zurich, um, he redefined uh, these, he reformulated them, and he said that the Christian preacher should have dokeira, mm -hmm. so he's with the classics then, but then hortari, to exhort, and consolari, to comfort. Oh, okay. So to get back, to have a call back to our opening discussion, right? Yes. Our dokeira delectara moera, is it comprehensive? Bullinger would say... Well, not if you are a Christian teaching other Christians. You have to have these uh, goals instead. Gotcha. To teach, to exhort, and to comfort. 
Excellent. So something to think about. That's an excellent um, bracket on the on the okay. at the end of things. A good place to end. So yep. we got to wrap up here, Jeff. What do we need to do? Well, um, how about you say a little bit about the Moss Method and the LLPSI? Oh, I'll be brief. Yes. If you want to study Greek with me, go to mossmethod.com. Check out my program to take you from. Uh, neophyte to erudite. That's correct. It's yep. an excellent value. Lots of Greek instruction there and free instruction too. And also my Latin program, latinperdiem.com slash LLPSI. And I take you ab initio and try to teach you a Latin using Hans Orberg's fabulous book, Familia Romana. And how many uh, Latin per diem free lessons do you have out there right now? 1,962. You are closing in on two, two grand. I'm going to try to get to 2K. I don't know what I'm going to do then. I'll have to say the first five years, yeah. uh, with the exception of Sunday, I think I released one episode every day. That's amazing. I was very disciplined then. I'm thankful uh, to God for that. Since then, I have slowed down a little bit. And I release now maybe two per week okay. or so. Yeah. So I've tapered off, but hey, I'm getting old. Come on. Exactly. Yeah. That's right. Anyway, there's a lot of material there. It's not. It's, some of it's uneven, uh, but some of it's good, I believe. Excellent. We got to thank, as always, Mishka uh, for putting this together. And that's how uh, call quickly. She turns us around, makes us sound better than we actually are. Absolutely. What about these guys, Scott and Ken? Oh, the opening lines, that guitar riff and that bass and all that stuff. Ken composed almost all that music, and Scott uh, plays it so beautifully. Plus the bumper music for the ads. Uh, we're very grateful to these gentlemen for their generosity and sterling musicianship. Absolutely. Always. Hey, if you want a shout out, you've got a question, you've got an idea for an episode, uh, don't hesitate to get in touch with us. You can write to Dave at Dave at ad nauseum.com. Don't forget that V. Or Jeff at ad nauseum.com. Don't forget the V. Yep. If you have written us an email recently and have not received a response, uh, we humbly apologize. You are not forgotten. We're just a little slow on the uh, the uptake. Yes. And Dave, what are we doing uh, our next episode? I, I think this is still a little TBD. You, you know, it's it's having been kind of locked into the Indian oh, for, so, for I so long. I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah. Right. Well, we got a great guest coming up very soon. Yes, I'm excited about and that. And that's going to be excellent. Not yep. sure exactly when that's going to drop. Yep. But stay tuned. Yes. And uh, thank you so much for listening. Jeff. You have our gustatory parting shot. I do. This comes from Julia Child. Who, the inimitable. Yes. And through these these parting shots, I've really come to to adore her. She's incredible. She's incredible. Isn't she? Uh, she wrote in uh, her book, My Life in France, the German birds didn't taste as good as their French cousins, nor did the frozen Dutch chickens we bought in the local supermarkets. The American poultry industry had made it possible to grow a fine looking fryer in record time and sell it as, at a reasonable price. But no one mentioned that the result usually tasted like the stuffing inside of a teddy bear. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening. Thank you. Thank you.